Well, hello, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. How many of you right now, be honest, could use a little bit more chill in your internal life? Could you use less stress and potentially more relaxation, more joy, more flow? Well, then in today's episode, I'm talking to the perfect guest for you. Her name is Kelly Smith. She is a globally celebrated yoga and meditation teacher. She's the founder of Yoga For You. Um, and on Instagram, I think that's how I know her. She's Yoga For You Online. And she's the host of an iTunes chart topping podcast, which is called Mindful In Minutes. And it's all guided meditations. Um, so she's she, we have very similar ideas and thoughts about meditation, like there's no one size fits all when it comes to meditation or mindfulness, but how meditation itself, we talk about um, on this in this interview, how to make it accessible to you. No matter how busy you are, there is actually a way that you can become a meditator. And as I like to say, if you have a butt and a chair or a couch, you are a meditator, my friend. So I hope that you enjoy this episode with Kelly Smith as much as I enjoyed interviewing her. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kelly Smith, welcome to the Terry Cole Show. Hey, how are you, Terry? I'm great. I'm so excited that we're finally getting it together for you to be on the show. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I want to start with a question that it, it always fascinates me because I'm someone who um, meditation is a big part of what I teach and foundation of my therapy practice and all of these things. I'm always so curious when I see other people, when I recognize this and someone else. So would you tell us your story of how did you come to really become a meditation expert and teacher? You've got a beautiful podcast. Tell us your story. Yeah. So, you know, I came to meditation through yoga but I have to say that it wasn't um, a linear journey because I used to be a Shavasana skipper in yoga. I admit it. I am reformed. I used to be one of those. I was there for the stretch. I was there for the physical. And then, you know, I'd take off. I did it as cross training for, for sports. And when I was 16, my mom was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer and I was mm. her primary caregiver. And it was in that moment that I was introduced to some of the softer sides of yoga. Meditation is one of the eight limbs to yoga. And I started to explore it. I started to learn about the benefits of Shavasana, of slowing down, of turning inward. We started doing some visualizations together, some meditation together. And, you know, I still didn't necessarily pursue it, but that's when I really was introduced to the power of being able to turn inward and being able to hit the pause button and to be an observer of your thoughts. And it's something that I return to again and again during those times of need, when you're just feeling like, you know, you have nowhere to turn, you have nothing to do. So you're going to turn inward. You're going to look inward for the answers. And after I graduated college and didn't know what I wanted to do with myself, um, as many do, I decided that I wanted to teach yoga. So I became a yoga teacher and one thing led to another. I moved for love. I found myself in a rural part of Missouri and I opened, yes, I know <laughs> it surprised me too. Uh, and I ended up opening a yoga studio there and I had so many students that they just, they needed something more than the physical. They, you know, maybe weren't necessarily always comfortable with the word meditation, but they were just yearning for a way to turn inward. And I saw that hunger in them and it really challenged me to deepen my practice and to understand meditation for myself so I could best serve my students. And that ultimately just kind of kicked everything off. And I've sort of just carved this path of wanting to help people turn inward, connect with their true selves and find the joy that's already within them. Love it. So for those who don't even know anything about yoga, there, there could be people listening who are like, I don't even know what Shavasana is. That is the meditative restorative pose that we usually do at the end of a yoga practice. Um, but I can definitely identify with what you're saying of, you know, for me up until I had sort of a, a health crisis in my late twenties, early thirties, you know, the gym, yoga, everything was about the shape of my ass and really not about the shape of my soul or my mind. Right. And I think that 
you you being like I was there for the stretch, but not for the the relaxation part because it can be stressful if you're not used to it. So for people who are listening, who want to not skip the Shavasana and who maybe want to go down this path of meditation, how do you invite people into this journey? Yeah. So I always like to kind of, I guess, give a little disclaimer, right? They say quiet the mind and the soul shall speak. It's actually quiet the mind and everything will start yelling at you. (laughs) And it's, it's, I mean, it's the truth. And I think for many people, I hear this all the time with my students, Terry, I'm sure you hear this all the time too. Turning inward can be scary. Mm -hmm. We live in this space of constantly go, 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 be stimulated, do more, be more. And it makes it so that we become very disconnected to ourselves. So once we finally, it's like when you have that partner and they're always on their cell phone and you're trying to talk to them and they finally put it down and they look at you and you're like, oh, thank goodness you're finally listening. When you begin to turn inward and slow down, your body and your mind and your heart are all of a sudden like, well, thank goodness you're listening to me. I have a lot to say. And it can be scary. It can be a little tricky at first because a lot may come up. But I always tell people just, you know, it's all going to be okay. And it's really meditation itself. As you know, Terry, it's just single pointed concentration. So you're just taking your mind instead of allowing it to be a light bulb, like it is when you're walking around all day, we're making it a laser pointer and focusing it on one thing. So if you are new to meditation or perhaps you've fallen off the bandwagon, just remember single pointed concentration. And we're just going to take our minds and focus it on one thing. That could be the breath. That could be a mantra. That could be a feeling. That could be something you're manifesting. It can be anything. So if the idea of slowing down and quote, shutting off your mind, which I hear all the time is Mm. people think meditation, you somehow magically shut your mind off. Mm -hmm. Um, If that sounds scary to you, don't let it be scary. We are just trying to focus all of our mental power on one thing. You get to choose what that thing is. And you're going to let the dust settle a little bit. And you may start to unlock some really powerful things within you. It's so, um, it's so interesting. Like the reframe that you just gave, I think that it takes away so much of the pressure that people feel with meditation. Like somehow there's some perfect way to do it. Or I always thought before I actually got a practice, which took a really long time and a really lot of effort. I mean, I've had it for like 20 years, but there was many years before that where I didn't. And I kept thinking I could like shortcut it. I was going to do a weekend at the open center. I'm sure that's going to do it. I'm going to do, you know, I was always looking for the fast track to whatever. Um, It didn't stick, of course. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of this um, mindfulness practices that we're talking about now that, do you you know David G, my, my friend, meditation teacher, David G with the white hair? Um, Yes, I am familiar with David G. Okay, so he's the cutest. And he's the person 20 years ago (laughs) who taught me how to um, meditate at the Mm -hmm. Chopra Center. And, you know, he works with uh, returning combat vets and police departments all over the country and a whole bunch of other sort of more military-based folks that would certainly not be necessarily familiar with the eight limbs of yoga or anything of that ilk. But again, it's all about exactly what you just said laser focusing your mind on this part of your body, then this part of your body, then, and just the relaxation that comes from stopping the light bulb, as you described it from blowing up every 12 seconds with another idea, another thought, another shiny object from this to this is so, um, relaxing, right? Mm -hmm. There's something up here that actually relaxes us, but for your own like your own journey? What does your own practice look like now? Yeah. So my practice, I recently had a child. Um, so it's (laughs) definitely evolved because the world has been turned upside down, inside out and everything in between. So I have really been focusing on checking in with my feelings and having, so studies tell us that around eight to 12 minutes a day of meditation is enough to get the neurological and physical benefits of meditation. So I always, and you know, You said it perfectly, Terry. I like to take the pressure off. If you're waiting to do something until it's quote perfect or you're perfect, you're never going to get started. So I do the same thing. I try to embody what I tell my students and have realistic expectations for yourself. I'm juggling Mm -hmm. working, having a baby at home, doing all the things. And so, you know, 
taking a weekend away for a meditation retreat or meditating for an hour every day. It's not going to happen. So I like to get up just a little bit earlier than everyone else, a little Mm -hmm. quiet time. I try to sit for about 10 minutes and I start by checking in with how I'm feeling how I'm actually feeling, what's, you know, what's going on. The answer is different every day. And then I will pull some tools from my toolbox and do some kind of a meditation practice based on the feedback that my body or my mind or my heart is giving me. So maybe I work with loving kindness if I'm feeling frustrated, or maybe I work with a mantra if I'm being called to do that. Um, But I just try to do about 10 minutes each day in the morning before the world wakes up. And that is just, that's what it looks like for me. And I'm totally okay with that. You know, I love what you're saying, Kelly, because it also is accessible. It's like, there's something about being a meditation teacher and people coming, you know, that sometimes I get the feeling that there's an expectation that I'm meditating 12 hours a day or something. And I'm like, are you kidding? I'm just like everyone else, (laughs) right? My meditation practice can be amazing. Then it can totally go to shit. And this is just life. So I always find, um, I always get my husband, like if, 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 you know, I was writing a book, it was really hard to, to stay on track, you know, and I'll always go to Vic and my husband and be like, okay, can you please help us get back on track with meditation? He's like, sure. And as soon as there's someone else I'm checking in with, and, and he's not bossy about it. He's just like, Hey, or as soon as we get up, you want to grab the timer or we're going to meditate, you know? And I'm like, yeah, because for so many years together, we did it, but you still fall off sometimes, even if you're a meditation teacher, even if it is amazing for our lives. So what is your theory? Why do you think it is that even though we know it's awesome, makes you feel great, creates for me, it creates internal expansion, probably two seconds of reaction time, like all of these great things that up the quality of my life, yet I still fall off. So what is your theory about why we still fall off? (laughs) Well, my main theory is that we are human and that is why (laughs) we fall off. I think that as humans, we are innately imperfect. I think that is what can make life really beautiful and really special. It's what makes us unique. But I think that, you know, we don't always do the things every minute of every day that are there to serve our greatest and highest good. That's not necessarily how we are always wired or designed as humans. But I think that for me, at least when I do fall off the bandwagon and I do too, as a meditation teacher, it happens. Life gets in the way you'll fall off, but you know, hopefully you find your way back to it. I think that's just a part of the human experience. Again, I I think we're so hyper-focused and I'm sure you see this all the time, Terry, like we just want to be perfect all the time and we want to do it quote (laughs) right. And Mm -hmm. we're chasing perfection and, you know, doing it correctly or finding this magical balance in life where everything just is in harmony. And I don't think that's realistic. And I don't think that's a fair expectation that we set on ourselves. So I think that as we go through life, there's going to be times, there's always going to be ebbs and flows in life. And that's going to happen in your meditation practice too. And that's perfectly okay. But when that happens, I always try to remember how good it feels and how useful I find meditation to be. And so I look for the little cues in myself. So I know when I'm skipping my meditation practice, I get a little, a little agitated. I get a little grumpy. I get a little, you know, the frustration comes just, it comes faster than it usually does. I try to watch for those cues. I'm like, you know what? I don't want to be snippy with my kids. I don't want Mm -hmm. to, you know, I don't want to be grumpy. I don't want to be waking up in the middle of the night with anxiety. I need Mm -hmm. to return to this thing that I know helps me. And I think it's beautiful, Terry, that, you know, you have, you know, you can rely on a partner to say, Hey, help me, you know, give me that nudge back. But yeah, yeah, I think it's just, we're human. You know, Mm -hmm. it it happens. It's just like everything else. It's, it's like, it's just like eating well or hydrating Mm -hmm. enough or exercising. And mostly I do all of those things, but again, not perfectly. Right. And, and it, there, there can't be that expectation that we will do it perfectly. But as Vic and I always say, a crappy meditation is better than no meditation. Cause we'll always check in like, how, how was your time in stillness and silence today, whatever. And sometimes he'll be like really noisy. I'm like, yep. <laughs> and then we'll, someone, someone will say, well, shitty meditation is better than no meditation. And that is true because what I think about it is that we are just by sitting, 
in stillness and silence, just by lighting my candle, just by getting my essential oil, doing the ritual that I do to create a little Zen Den where I meditate, that is immediately putting the universe on notice of what kind of day I'm planting the seeds for, taking the time to do that before I have my coffee. It's, there's something about, it's, there's a calibration of the day. And again, it doesn't mean that when I'm sitting there, I don't realize, wow, it's over. And I, I think I thought the entire time I was literally planning my day. Like, is that meditating or was I just thinking, you know what? I was sitting, there was the mm-hmm. lavender candle burning. It's better than not, you know? Absolutely. And I think it's so important sometimes too. I always challenge my students at times to step away from this idea of it was a quote, good meditation or quote, (laughs) bad meditation. Mm -hmm. These people, you know, they always want, we don't label things. We live in this world of duality. It was either good or it was bad. One, I think the meditation practices that we would quote say are, you know, bad. I think sometimes those are the most important ones and the most useful ones when you have, you know, the loud meditations, the days that it's hard to focus, be inquisitive about that. Why was it so hard to focus today? Why was it loud? Like what's going on? The whole, one of our biggest objectives when we're meditating is to be an observer of the self. And so Mm -hmm. when you have those days when you feel like you're struggling or you're being challenged in your meditation practice or you're antsy, you're having big feelings, whatever it is, use that as information about yourself when you're taking inventory. And I think that those are some of the most important practices because it gives you way more information. Just like we learned so much more during the times of our lives where it's bumpy as opposed Mm -hmm. to smooth rides. Like that's where we learn and we grow and we evolve. So I like to, my podcast, I always like to say, you know, embrace the challenging days be grateful for the distractions. Those mm. are the things that are helping you grow. They're the the resistance that we need to strengthen the mind and the heart. So I think that it's important to embrace those, you know, challenging practices. I think they're some of the most important ones. I totally agree. It's funny. Years and years ago, Vic and I were on a week long thing with Deepak and it was like meditating a bazillion hours a day. It was, and it was all very challenging, but doing it, you know, just, just doing it. In the middle, I don't even know what was happening, but in the middle of what was happening, you just hear Deepak's voice and he's like, I know many of you think that the person in front of you who is making noise with their candy wrapper or blowing their (laughs) nose is ruining your meditation. But you misunderstand. They are your meditation. Yep. And I was like, oh my God. And from that point forward, every place I ever meditated, my apartment in New York City, friggin' garbage truck could be backing up, beep, beep, beep. And I was like, garbage truck is my meditation. Not ruining it, it is my meditation. Knowing that, here's life, exactly what you're saying. Life is messy. There will not be, if we can only meditate in like under the perfect conditions, you're never gonna meditate, right? Mm -hmm. And in learning to get your, your stillness, you know, being able to drop into that gap, even when someone is opening their candy wrapper or <laughs> blowing their nose, there's something that is a skill because it also creates tolerance, at least for me in life where before I was a meditator, I was really very, just an imbalanced pitta. I'd have to say like very type a, very judgy, very like yum, yuck all over town. Like <laughs> everything is good or bad, you know, as you were saying before. I think we have that in common. I think this is why. <laughs> before we hit record and you said, I feel like we look like we could be related. No, I think it's just the like high functioning overdrive pitta in us recognizing one another. (laughs) I think that's what's happening here. I think that's right. I mean, I love everything that you're saying. It's so true. I, you know, one of the biggest lessons that I learned in meditation is exactly what you're describing. I was doing a 10 day thing and it was for loving kindness meditation. That's what we were focusing on. And it was- And can you explain that quickly for yeah, people ab- who don't know what it is? Absolutely. So I really like to practice um, a specific kind of loving kindness meditation, which is called TWIM, Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. Uh, it was formed by this Buddhist monk, Bonte Vilmaranzi. And it's a, way, it's a way of meditating where your point of concentration is the sensation of loving kindness. Mm-hmm. And you try to radiate it to different people in this particular style. You radiate it to you know someone that 
you you know love it's very easy to radiate to someone mm -hmm. that you're neutral towards someone that is really challenging to you and you ultimately are working on radiating it in all directions and just becoming a being of loving kindness i find this practice to be incredibly soothing and very nurturing for me but it was during this time when i was learning how to do this was one i was working with my teacher I was like, and there I said, how are you feeling? I said, I'm feeling really frustrated. <laughs> said, I've never meditated for this long in my life. It's all day, every day. Everything is annoying. I'm really <laughs> agitated and I just want to do something else. And yet I just have to sit here or walk over there and meditate. And one of the biggest lessons was that my teacher, Bonte, he said, well, send some loving kindness to that frustration. It's this frustration. Mm -hmm. It's these sounds, it's these distractions. Thank them for what they are doing for you and your practice and send more loving kindness to these things, to the, you know, garbage truck that is you know, backing up. I, I've, I've been to New York city. I know exactly what kind of interesting <laughs> sounds you must be experiencing during mm -hmm. your meditation practice. It's I'm sure never a dull moment, right? You know, send a little loving kindness to the person driving that dump truck. Thank you for the opportunity that you're giving me to practice my meditation to return after I've been distracted. Mm -hmm. And that really changed my mindset of not only being aware of my own thoughts when I'm meditating my own feelings towards it, but how I as a person can try to just send some of that goodwill and that loving kindness to other beings or to those around me and how it's so easy to quickly get irritated with someone or something. And that's a choice we're making. We're choosing mm -hmm. to be irritated by that. Like, who are we to say, oh, excuse me, you know, trash services. Why are you doing <laughs> this right now when I'm meditating? Like, what is it about my right. meditation practice and my ego that makes it so much more important than, you know, the New York City waste removal? It isn't. Right. I'm just right. choosing to think that way. And it, it really changed my perspective when I was taught that. Yeah, that's amazing um, to, again, though, it's it's requiring you to stay in the moment and to focus on the feeling as opposed to trying to stuff the feeling down, shove it under the rug, or build a case for the feeling, like bu building, like literally like a case, like I have the right to be annoyed because this is a stupid 10 day thing or whatever it is, where the whole, what you, you mentioned before about being the observer of our thoughts. And this, I mean, I would, there's many life changing things I'm sure we both have done on our journeys, but this concept of becoming the observer without judgment of my thoughts, of myself, of others, that alone is, for me was an incredibly life altering experience because it gave me the time between the, like when you may have still have a little bit of the reaction, but observing takes a moment. And I had to be meditating to have the moment to observe. Then I had a choice. Like I could not react, right? I could not be like, damn the trash collector. Rather than doing that, I could see, hmm, I'm witnessing, I'm observing this moment of frustration and let me be grateful and let me go sink deeper and let me breathe more deeply or let me do something else. But let me note it without judging myself, without judging the guys or woman who's doing their job, without judging anything. And that is a shift, you know, Kelly, for most people, because I don't know, for what you, you were saying before, I mean, people, we do live in a world of like yum, yuck, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. I love what you just shared. And I think you know, that's so true. We're so quick to judge everyone and everything, but in particular, and I still struggle with this too, because again, you know, we're all human. So sometimes as a meditation teacher, I'm hard on myself. I judge mm -hmm. myself. I judge my own thoughts. Sometimes I, you know, fall off the meditation bandwagon, and have to bring myself back. It's all a part of the process. But for me, that judgment piece is huge because so much of my life, I was living in judgment, but I was unaware. I just thought, you know, that these were just thoughts that I was having. And it wasn't until I slowed down and started practicing meditation, getting that bird's eye view and being like, wait a minute, that's not necessarily frustration. 
you're just judging that person for no reason, or you're just being hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. My, my therapist, you know, and I'm sure you'll appreciate this, Terry, but she always says, well, Kelly, is it a thought or is it a truth? And this always resonates with me so deeply because there's so Mm -hmm. many things, especially transitioning into motherhood right now Mm -hmm. that I have a lot of thoughts. Many of them aren't necessarily true. You know, Mm -hmm. if there's something, you know, if my son is struggling with something, is it because I'm a bad mother? Right. No, it it doesn't make me a bad mother. He's just doing it all on his own time. And that's okay. That's a thought. Mm -hmm. It's not a truth. And I think when we can step back and we can observe the thoughts that we're having, we can start to discern, is it a thought? Is it a truth? But we also can then look at our thoughts as a whole and do a little bit of inventory. Like, is this, is this actually what I think or what I want to think? Like, is mm. this the path that I want to go down with my mind and my thoughts? And often, especially when you're starting this process or starting some kind of a, um, you know, journey to the self, it's usually not like people don't usually come to meditation when everything is beautiful and wonderful and sunshine and rainbows. And it's going great for them mm-hmm. because <laughs> why seek out a tool like this if everything's already perfect? And people always, don't you find Terry, people always come to meditation because something's up or something, (laughs) or even if they just don't quite feel connected, there's always something that gives them that nudge towards meditation. And it's never a a good, great, wonderful thing. Absolutely. I I think that even if people would have a thought, like I would like to meditate when life is good, the the impetus to act is usually something painful because mm-hmm. it's the same exact way for people to seek um, therapeutic intervention. They'll, they'll have a thought like, I should get in therapy. It sounds like it would be good. Then something happens and they're on their knees. Then they're like, oh crap, now I'm actually going to make a phone call. One last topic I wanted to cover with you, Kel, about yeah. meditation is the neurological, like what is happening with the brain? Let's talk a little bit about how a dedicated meditation practice yeah actually impacts the organ of the brain. Yes. I love this. And Terry, I know you love some good science like I do. I do. So fa- <laughs> I know. I know. We, another thing we have in common, we're science loving pittas. What can we say? But I love what meditation does to the brain. So, you know, giving the spark notes version, basically what's happening when we meditate is we are taking the neurological activity in our brain. We're shifting it away from the amygdala. So the amygdala is kind of like the drama queen of our brain. It's responsible for fight or flight. It's responsible for anxiety, pain, and worry. Now, in most people, we have an overactive amygdala because it kicks off fight or flight based on what we see. So a stressor. And if we're constantly living under stress, seeing distressing things, hearing distressing things, our amygdala is constantly firing. Now our brains, like every other part of our body are designed to adapt. So if the brain says, wait a minute, I need fight or flight all the time. I have stress all the time, anxiety all the time. Amygdala, start working harder, start working faster. So for most people, we have this overactive amygdala. Now what happens when we meditate is that the neurological activity shifts from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain, like right behind your forehead. It helps with emotion regulation, with concentration, with focus. So we're shifting that activity away from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. So usually after about eight ish weeks of 10 minutes a day, what's going to happen is that the amygdala is actually going to begin to shrink and atrophy and the prefrontal cortex is going to become bigger. It's going to become stronger. There'll be more neurons there and more surface area, more of those, you know, folds. I always joke. It's, you know, the part of the body that everyone's trying to get, you know, bigger and wrinklier. And it's true (laughs) because we want it bigger, denser, more surface area, more neurological activity. So then what happens is we're actually rewiring our brain to have smaller physiological anxiety, worry, and stress and fight or flight reactions, and to have a greater ability to have emotion regulation, focus, and concentration. And we know Sarah Lazar out of um, Boston does really incredible research into this and how it actually changes the brain. So my other science lovers, give her a Google if you aren't familiar, you'll love it. But we're rewiring our brain for less anxiety, pain, and worry, and better emotion regulation and more focus and concentration. Love it. Love it. Thank you so much for sharing it. Because for those of you who are listening or maybe watching this on YouTube, for those of you who sort of poo-pooed the meditation thing a little bit or feel like it's fluffy or it's woo-woo, it's really not. (laughs) And there is so much solid data 
about the changes and you can read them and there's massive studies done. This is not like, you know, a, a control group of 40. Do you know what I mean? Somewhere in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. This is massive. We're talking about Harvard Medical. We're talking about the Mayo Clinic. We're, th- these are really places that have done their work. And so it's something that, and it's also free, right? You So tell people, Kel, where they can find you. Tell them if they want to meditate with you. The t- tell us about your podcast and where else they can find you. Sure. So I have a podcast. It's called Mindful in Minutes. It is mostly guided meditations. They are all less than 20 minutes and all are welcome. It is a beautiful community over there to show up as you are, no matter where you're at in your meditation or in your life. There are, I've been doing it for almost five years. So there's hundreds to choose from. Just scroll, find one and you say, you know what, that's a topic I need today. Just hit play. And you'll just listen to the sound of my voice leading you through a meditation practice. So I'd love to have you over there. We can meditate together. Maybe we could sleep together in the evening. I hear, you know, (laughs) that I sleep with people sometimes with those evening meditations, (laughs) even if I didn't know it, but I'm apparently busy at night. Um, But you have a sleep one too. I do. I have, I do have a handful (laughs) of sleep ones. So, so I, you know, (laughs) yes. So, um, but yeah, so I would love to have people over there. Otherwise you can find me on Instagram. Um, my handle is yoga for you online or my website, but just start with the podcast. Listen to one, as you know, Terry, one of the biggest things with meditation, meditation teacher, they have to resonate with you. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe, you know, I, I welcome everyone with open arms. Come see if it's a good fit. See if those meditations resonate with you or not. If they do, great. Hang out for a while. If not, that's okay. Go find a meditation teacher that does resonate with you. I think that's like that kind of secret sauce into some meditation magic is finding the teacher that really resonates with you. Yes. And don't judge yourself. It's such a good point, Kelly, because don't judge yourself on on who does or doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just like anything else. Mm-hmm. You're going to only be drawn if the person, if you resonate with yeah. the vibes that the person is giving off of you, like the sound of their voice or whatever it is, you can't make yourself. So part of it is there's so many of us out there doing it. So you have tons of free stuff online. Mine's that most of my stuff is on YouTube. Your stuff is on your um, podcast and your handle on IG again is yoga for you. Yep. Yoga for you online. So my business Um, is yoga for you. And then the podcast falls under that umbrella. So that's where you can find me to say hi or ask a question. But yeah, there's so many wonderful meditation teachers out there doing incredible work. You just have to find the one that that fits you. So I'm sure Terry and I both welcome anyone with open arms if that's us, but if not, (laughs) go find that person that resonates with you. That's that's the secret to success. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kel, for being here. I really appreciated your time and energy. You guys, all the information that you talked about, we're going to stuff it all in the show notes as we always do. So we will see you next time on The Terry Cole Show.